morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. And thank you all for your ongoing support of, of these live streams, which as you know, we're providing free of charge as a public service. If you're enjoying these series, particularly dance, which is so popular, please consider going to our website at lawac.org to become a member or make a contribution. We can't do this without your support. It's now my pleasure to introduce politics professor Dan Schnur and his weekly series, Politics in the Time of Coronavirus. Dan has three terrific topics. I'm so excited about these, Dan. Number one, why the new COVID outbreaks are different, and if so, what that means. Second, did Russia pay bounties to the Taliban? If so, who knew and when? And third, how will young people impact the 2020 election? For those of you who may be new to our series, we'll be taking questions in about 20 minutes. There's a control panel on the right-hand side of the screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions. And as always, she'll try to take as many of them as she can. Dan, I'm so excited about today's discussion. So take it away. <laughs> well, Kim, um, thank you as always for, for having me. And thanks as always to all of you who are joining us today for this conversation. Um, some of you may remember the, the famous quote from, from Winston Churchill. And Churchill once said, nothing in life is so exhilarating as to be shot at without result. And I would humbly suggest an update to Mr. Churchill's quote for a time of pan this time of pandemic. Because it appears that many Americans have determined, decided that there's nothing as exhilarating as being worried about contracting COVID-19 and then staying healthy. And what we've seen over the last few weeks is the result of that exhilaration in bars and restaurants, on beaches and parks and family gatherings. And so now we're seeing a real resurgence in the number of coronavirus cases, uh, positive tests, and most worrisome in uh, a marked increase in the number of hospitalizations. Um, we're gonna talk today uh, in just a minute about how this COVID outbreak or this stage of it is different than the one that we saw earlier this spring. But before we do, just some news from this morning that some of you may not have seen. Uh, new job reports are out today. And the new job numbers show that unemployment is dropped again in the US for the second consecutive month to a much greater degree than many had thought possible. Uh, so as uh, our, our June figures show, unemployment down to 11.1% down from 14% last month, but obviously still a way above the pre-COVID figures. It's worth remembering though, that those monthly job figures only cover the first 12 days of the month. So just like at the beginning of April, we didn't see the full impact of the coronavirus shutdown because the numbers hadn't quite caught up with the late March impact. It's worth remembering, even while we should be, very encouraged by this continued drop in unemployment, that these numbers were developed prior to the most recent outbreaks here in California and across the country. But what is clear is that this new stage of the virus uh, is moving, and it's moving from older people to younger people, and from blue states to red states. And so today, at least, let's focus on that geographic shift. Now, some of you may remember, those of you who've been participating in, these, in this webinar series throughout the spring, you may remember that back at, way back in early April, we talked about how much more of the impact of the virus was hitting states that had voted for Hillary Clinton versus states that had voted for Donald Trump. Now, Clinton states tended to be much more heavily populated and much more densely populated. And so it wasn't surprising back then that as of early April, back in the first peak of the virus, 67% of the new COVID-19 cases back in early April were taking place in states that Hillary Clinton had carried in 2016. Well, now as the virus moves to the South and to the Western United States, those numbers have completely flipped. As of Monday, the states that voted for Donald Trump back in 2016 have accounted for 
almost three quarters of the new cases. Now, that's brought a very sharp change to the nature of the debate taking place over the virus. Um, these newer high prevalence areas are mainly spread, as I said, throughout the South and the Great Plains and Rocky Mountains. These communities broken down to a county level are nearly 70% white and they cast almost 60% of their votes for Donald Trump in 2016. Now, what's interesting is if you overlay a political context, what you find is that the shift in the virus from democratic leaning areas to Republican leaning communities, we've also seen that impact the president's poll numbers. Over that same time period, as you've all seen in the newspapers, the president's approval ratings and his standing in the polls vis-a-vis -vis Joe Biden has dropped somewhat precipitously. But what we're seeing is that, according to Pew Research done just this week, that those whose opinions of Donald Trump have dropped the most since earlier this spring live in areas that were hit hardest by the pandemic. In other words, there's a significant link between living in places where the effects of the coronavirus have been worse and views of Trump will be getting worse as well. If you look into the numbers a little bit deeper, what we see is this, is areas, that is counties, with a low impact of COVID-19, they showed low impact counties showed 38% approval for President Trump, 33% disapproval. Those with high impact of the virus, on the other hand, showed a 30% approval and a 45% disapproval. And we've been able to track a shift in the president's poll numbers as the virus has moved geographically as well. Now, these numbers for, were from about two weeks ago, before the spread accelerated even more dramatically into Texas and Florida and other red states. So going forward, it's going to be very instructive to watch to see if those areas, those communities, those voters that originally supported Trump's approach to the virus continue to stick with him as they feel the impact of the pandemic more directly in their own lives. Now, the good job numbers today, toward that end, create almost a reversal of the previous situation for Trump voters in red states. For most of the spring, those supporters of the president, they heard about the severity of the outbreak, but they weren't seeing it in their own communities, in their own neighborhoods, in their own lives and social circles. So now they're hearing about economic progress but they're beginning to experience great difficulty firsthand. And once again, it's gonna be worth watching to see whether the poll numbers change among some of the president's strongest supporters as the pandemic becomes more of a force in their own communities. Now, of course, it's not just red states that are dealing with this, uh, this exuberance. Uh, California is experiencing the dramatic growth in the number of cases as well. And Governor Gavin Newsom and Mayor Eric Garcetti and other elected officials around the state are reacting very, uh, uh, very strongly. So with that, let's go to our first question for all of you. And Claire, if you can put the first question up on the screen, let's get your opinion on this. Who deserves most of the blame for the increase in cases and positive tests? We're seeing these numbers go up very dramatically. Um, but who's, whose fault is it? Is it the political leaders and government officials for not following the original guidelines on reopening? Or is it the rest of us, if you excuse the expression, for being irrationally exuberant when we man managed to avoid the virus after our efforts of the first few months? Or is it both or is it neither? Let's see your responses and we'll, uh, we'll see what all of you think. Very interesting. 18% say it's our political leaders and government officials deserve, deserve the blame. Only 10% of you blame us uh, for going out on our own the way we did. 70%, more than two thirds say, plenty of blame to go around. Uh, both our political leaders in a failure of leadership and the rest of us, if you will, in a failure of followership. And hopefully that's a question we can dig into a little bit when we get to questions in conversation about 10 minutes from now. Uh, but in the meantime, let's move on to our second topic. As some of you may know, uh, as you get our emails letting you know about the topics we plan to cover in these webinars, originally our second topic this week was gonna be about 
was going to be regarding the debate over annexation of the West Bank and Israel and the broader geopolitical challenge in the Middle East. And for those of you who are looking forward to that discussion, you can still look forward to it. We're going to come back to it next week. But as, of course, all of you know, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu decided to delay the decision on annexation. And given the very explosive allegations that have surfaced regarding the question of whether Russia paid bounties to the Taliban for killing American soldiers, we figured it was worth rejiggering the lineup a little bit in order to talk about such an important conversation that's now taking place in Washington, D.C. and in foreign capitals around the world. So on basics, last Friday, or six days ago, the New York Times reported that a Russian military intelligence agency sent money, considerable amounts of money, to a Taliban-linked account, and that that money was used as a bounty for Taliban militants, Taliban militants to kill U.S. and coalition troops. Now, apparently, there's been some disagreement between the U.S. intelligence agencies about the reliability of these findings, and that's where the complication comes in. The National Security Agency was very skeptical of the information, and it's worth noting that the NSA tends to rely primarily on electronic intelligence, eavesdropping, computer-based work, and so on, for their, uh, to, to come to their conclusions. The CIA, on the other hand, which relies on human sources and informants primarily, they found these allegations very, very credible. And so uh, given that disagreement within the US intelligence community, there's also some disagreement, which will hopefully be cleared up in the weeks ahead, as to given that conflict, whether and how that information was presented to the president. Intelligence sources, we talked to the Times and other news media, say that Trump did get the information about the allegations against Russia. White House staff says that that information was not presented to him, at least not verbally, um, given the fact that there was still debate within intelligence, uh, the intelligence community. So there's three possibilities here. Possibility number one, the information was given to the president, not just in writing, but verbally. And we can talk about that as well. The information was given to the president who didn't act on it for whatever the reason, which, which we can also discuss. The info was given to the president, he didn't act on it, and he continued to pursue his partnership with Russia and with Putin, including efforts to bring Russia into the group of eight uh, earlier this year. Second possibility is that the information was not given to the president, that high level White House staff and intelligence officials debated it and decided that because of the lack of certainty, they did not present him the information. And of course, if that's the case, it would lead to very important questions about why he was not informed, given his conversations with Putin on many issues and given such dramatic import of the information. And the third possibility, as Trump himself has said, is that the reports were definitely false and dismissed, which is why he wasn't briefed. And I suspect if that one is true, if that option is true, we'll know that within the next few days. But before we go on, let's, uh, let's ask you what you think. And Claire, if we can put up the second question. Um, do you think, each of you, do you think the Russian government did in fact pay Taliban forces a bounty for killing US troops? Yes, no, or don't know. And obviously we're asking for your best guess because we know that most of you, not all of you, but most of you are not particularly active in any of the US intelligence agencies. So we'll settle for a guess today and your best assessment based on your reading of the news and your assessment. So Claire, if we have the results, let's see what people said. 74% of our respondents, roughly three quarters, believe that the Russian government did pay Taliban forces a bounty for killing the troops. Only 3% said no, and 23%, almost a quarter, don't know, at least not yet at this point. All right. So plenty of disagreement in Washington, a little bit less among our participants this week. But let's talk, but let's back up a second. While it's obviously critically important whether the president knew this information and when he knew it, to paraphrase another famous quote from a previous generation of American politics, if either of those first two possibilities is accurate, whether the president was briefed or not, still leaves us to very difficult questions about what the United States should do now. How should we handle such an explosive matter with the Russians going forward? Both parties, both Democrats and Republicans right now, seem much more interested in the mechanics and logistics of whether or how Trump was briefed. 
But either way, this is a very high stakes and it's a very challenging, a uh, very dangerous challenge to navigate. So let's go to our third question. We'll ask your opinion. And then once again, we can talk about this more in the question and answer period coming up in a few minutes. What do you think? If the allegations are against Russia are true, and the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of you said that they were true, how should the US respond? Should we respond diplomatically through protest and warnings? Should we resp respond economically with the use of sanctions? Or given that this resulted in the death of US forces, should we respond militarily with military force? And let's see what your thoughts are on this very difficult question. Hmm, very interesting. 22%, a little bit less than a quarter of you, believe that a diplomatic response is necessary. 73%, almost three quarters of you, think it should be stronger measures, economic sanctions. And only 5% believe uh, that the US should use military force. Very, very interesting. So finally, let's go on to our, let's go on to our third topic for the day. Um, and that is how, and that is last week we talked about older voters. The week before that, we talked about female voters. This week, we're gonna continue our demographic, uh, our discussion about the demographics of the election by talking about young people. How young people, how young voters will impact the 2020 election or not. And so I'm gonna start this part of the conversation by offering you two sets of poll numbers broken down by generation. The first set of poll numbers is simply whether voters prefer Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Now, among those voters 65 and older, as we discussed last week, that age group is roughly tied, which is pretty remarkable in itself, given that it's been 20 years since a Democratic candidate has won a majority of the senior vote. Among 60, voters 65 and older, uh, the candidates are roughly tied. Among voters 50 and to 64 years old, it's also a relatively even split. Where Biden builds his lead in the polls, and most public opinion polls show him with a high single digit, low double digit lead, where he builds that lead entirely is among the two younger age groups. Among 30 to 49 year olds, Joe Biden is currently ahead of Donald Trump by a margin of 60% to 38%, a 22% gap. And among 18 to 29 year olds, the millennials and Generation Z, the youngest voters, those young people support Joe Biden 62% to 28% for Trump, a 34 point margin more than two to one. So it's very clear that young people, and the younger we go into electric, the more noticeable it is, young people in extraordinary numbers support Biden over Trump for president. But now I wanna give you a second set of figures. Uh, in the Pew Research poll early, earlier this week, Voters were also asked, and in particular, Biden voters specifically were asked whether their vote for Biden is more of a vote for Joe Biden or more of a vote against Donald Trump. Now, among older voters, voters age 65 and up, 57% um, said that their vote was a vote against Trump. 43% they're voting primarily because they like Biden, 57% because they're not uh, they do not care for Trump. Among 50 to 64 year olds, once again, the gap isn't, uh, the, the margin isn't that different. 41% are voting for Biden, 59% are voting against Trump. But once again, let's go to those two younger age groups. Among 30 to 49 year olds, 29% of Biden voting, voters are supporting the former vice president because they support him, 70% are voting for Biden because of their feelings about Trump. And among 18 to 29 year olds, the youngest age group in the electorate, only 16 are only 16 percent are voting for Joe Biden, and 84 percent are voting because of their motivation against Trump. Now it's reasonable for you to ask, why does that matter? Either way, it's a vote, right? Well, not so much. And before we go to questions, let's spend a couple of minutes talking about why those numbers that we've just gone through are so important. Well, we see that young people prefer Biden, but they're not that excited by him. They're not motivated by Joe Biden, they're motivated by Donald Trump. Um, many of these young voters, the majority of these young voters, supported other candidates in the primary, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, one of the other earlier candidates to withdraw. Um, 
And although Biden is their nominee and they prefer him to Trump, they still haven't found anything in him that really excites him or inspires him, which raises real questions about how motivated they will be to vote in on election day. And even while Biden's lead in the polls grows, eight, 10, eight points, 10 points, 12 points, we're still seeing that Trump's base of supporters is much more motivated and much more likely to turn out on election day than, than Biden's base. The Washington Post poll from last week shows that 69%, more than two thirds of Trump supporters were very enthusiastic about their candidate. 34% of Biden voters said that they were enthusiastic about theirs. The polls showed that 87% of Trump supporters said that they would definitely vote no matter what. Only 74%, a 13 point point gap, only 74% less than three quarters of Biden supporters said that they were definitely going to vote. In that margin in between enthusiasm for Trump and for Biden, where Biden falls off, it's almost entirely with young people and with minority communities. So we know, we know from extensive research, and I will tell you from my own work on campaigns way back in the day, we know that negative messaging, a campaign commercial, a speech, uh, an attack ad, where we criticize our opponent, we know that while voters don't like negative campaigning, we know they're much more likely to remember it. What we also know about negative campaigning is that negative messages don't change a voter's mind. If you're running a campaign for a Republican candidate and tell the voters something really horrible about the Democrat, a very proud, deep blue progressive is not going to turn around and vote for the Republican. They're just not going to vote. Similarly, if you're running a Democratic campaign and you target a critical message, a negative message toward the Republican, a deep red conservative Republican isn't going to switch over and vote for a progressive Democrat. They're going to stay home. So the impact of a negative campaign is not to change voters' minds, but to discourage your opponent's supporters from turning out. And so what that means is a harshly negative campaign from Trump, which of course we're already seeing, is likely to have its greatest effect on less motivated voters. And a heavily negative campaign from Trump is most likely to impact young people and minority voters, not to convince them to switch over to Trump, not to change their mind on who to vote for, but to convince them not to vote. And so we know that young people are leaning leftward in greater numbers than they have in many, many years. We know that the recent protests have excited and motivated and activated them in all sorts of ways. What we have yet to see is whether that enthusiasm and energy that we've seen on the streets over the last month or so, whether that's going to change into voting in November. And as we've talked about before on this webinar, if that does happen, if those young people do, do turn out, it becomes much more likely that Joe Biden is elected president. And if they don't, then it becomes much more likely that Biden could potentially suffer the same type of defeat that Hillary Clinton did four years ago. So let's do this. We've gone over three topics, and all of which at least I found interesting, and I hope that you do too. But let's shift into the second uh, portion of our program. And if Jessica's around, maybe she can join us and help us go through some of the questions that you've sent in. And for those of you who haven't, just a reminder that Jessica is taking your questions and please feel free to send them to us and we'll answer as many as we can in the 35 or so minutes that we've got left. Hi, Jessica. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good, how are you? Great, thank you. All right, our first question, what should Americans be most concerned about? Russia, voter suppression, or the pandemic? Boy, <laughs> um, if there is a D all of the above, I would offer that. But if I had, if I had to rank them, I would say that the pandemic probably is the most immediate and urgent of the threats, if only because it plays such a direct effect, not just on our politics and not just on our geopolitics, but on our very lives. Um, a close second, I would say Russia, uh, because Russia's growing assertiveness, not just with this Taliban program, but we're seeing all over the world in Ukraine. We're seeing Russian fighter jets in the Arctic that are being much more aggressive in buzzing US installations. 
Um, and we saw earlier this week, of course, that the Russian people voted, perhaps with some under some duress, to allow uh, Mr. Putin to stay in office uh, for another uh, decade plus until he turns 80 years old. Russia's economy is dramatically suffering. Reliable sources say that the impact of the pandemic on that country are much greater than Russian authorities have admitted. And Putin decided a long time ago that the best way to keep the Russian people on his side during difficult times is through a very nationalistic appeal of his own. And that nationalistic appeal, whether it's in Syria, whether it's in Ukraine, whether it's in Afghanistan, is a real threat, not just to the US, uh, but to our allies around the world. Voter suppression is an important topic and it's worth discussing in more detail than we have today. Um, but what I believe is that while it is an important challenge for us to face, it's a much more straightforward challenge. I don't know how to beat the pandemic. I'm not sure how to put Russia back in its box, but I know that the best way to beat back efforts toward voter suppression is to encourage people and do everything we can to help those who are most likely to be discouraged to turn out. And if those young people in minority communities that I talked about in the previous segment are given not just the encouragement, but the tools and the guidance, then the threat of voter suppression becomes a more minimal one. I wish there was as a direct solution, even if it's not an easy one, to the other two. Thank you. Um, what do you think will motivate younger voters? And do you think that Biden's VP choice will have an impact on that? Well, I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, Biden is not just actuarially yeah, uh, in a position to you know, have a difficult time reaching younger people, but his message and his agenda, which tends to be more centrist than progressive, is somewhat at odds with those of most younger people. Now, it's worth noting that you know, while Biden, like Trump, is, uh, is in his 70s and may not have a lot in common on a day-to-day -day basis with a teen or a 20-something, it is worth noting that when Ronald Reagan ran for president back in the 1980s, he enjoyed his strongest support among young people. And going back even further, there's similar evidence that Dwight Eisenhower and Franklin Roosevelt, even as they aged, were able to do the same. So it's not out of the question for Biden. The bigger challenge for Biden, as we've talked about on this webinar a number of times, is that he has to walk a very fine line between talking about things and emphasizing ideas that can motivate his base including those very progressive young people, but also talking about things and emphasizing agenda items that can appeal to voters in the political center. And because Biden himself tends to lean a little bit naturally toward that centrist approach, his biggest challenge, even more than the generation gap with young people, is an ideological gap. And ultimately, while it's not the most exciting or motivating of messages, young people are going to need to come to believe in order for Biden to be elected that while they might not be thrilled about him, that they prefer him to the alternative. Biden himself over the years has told a joke that he's variously attributed to his mother, his father, his grandmother, and grandfather. He says, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. And some more inspirational version of that message is what it's going to take to turn out young people because that's not a particularly inspirational message as a standalone. Can Barack Obama do that? I don't know. Can uh, a very exciting dynamic running mate do that? I don't know. Can Taylor Swift do that? I don't know. But the Biden campaign seems to be counting on the fact that Donald Trump can do that. That even if there's no way, going back to our previous conversation, for them to motivate these young people with a positive message on Joe Biden's behalf, that their overriding antipathy toward Trump will hopefully be enough to get them to the polls. Thank you. Realistically, what could Joe Biden do about Russian boundaries if he were president? Obama and Biden drew a line in the sand regarding Assad's use of chemical weapons in Syria, yet when those weapons were used, the Obama administration did very little. Well, I try not. Uh, I, I try not to take sides on these things, as all of you know, and as you certainly know, Jessica. But I do think, and I've heard many of President Obama's greatest admirers say the same thing, 
of his decision to walk back uh, from uh, his previous uh, declarations in Syria was one of the lower points of his presidency. And I think that was the case. My own opinion is that Biden, judging him not just by his eight years as Obama's vice president, but his prior decades in elective office, would be more likely to be more assertive in pushing back against the Russians in Ukraine than either Trump or Obama was when facing similar situations. Now that said, extensive military national security experience leads me to that belief with Biden. On the other hand, over his many years in the Senate, he has often voted for and counseled a less confrontational approach. Um, so I think he would be more likely to make it clear to Putin that he would draw lines that would be starker and more permanent than either Obama's or Trump's. Um, but I can't say that with absolute confidence because in the for many in many instances in the past, Senator Biden tended more toward the side of a, a conciliatory approach than a confrontational one. So probably, but not definitely. How's that for a, a bottom line? Sounds good. Um, if the Russians are paying the Taliban to kill US troops, how is that different from the US paying the Mujahideen to kill Russians? The fact that in both cases, it was unknown to the general public and Congress until it was leaked doesn't change the fact that bad things happen in war. Well, there, there's a longer conversation to be had, and we should probably set aside a segment for it either next week or the week after to talk not just about the politics and the geopolitics, but the real world impact of these types of decisions. But I suspect what is causing so much controversy over the last six days and will continue to cause controversy for many weeks ahead is only partially that the Russians may have funded the Taliban in this regard. But number one, that the president either did not know about it, which raises all sorts of questions about the judgment of his advisors, or knew about it and chose not just to do anything about it, but to continue to pursue very conciliatory, conciliatory relationship um, with Putin and with Russia. The fact that another superpower um, is targeting American troops for death is unforgivable. And there is a significant response that needs to be made as our own participants said when we asked them the poll question. But before we, uh, but the other aspect of this question, which particular election year is dominant, is once again, to go back to uh, 1974, what did the president know? And when did he know it? If he did know about it, what did he do and what did he not do? And if he didn't know about it, why not? So I hope we can come back for a longer conversation about this type of military engagement because it's not a, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's, well, longer conversation to be had on that front. But I think in the, in the immediate, finding out how this administration has made decisions when presented with this type of information is the first step toward resolution. Yeah, and I know that um, our State Department has been trying to negotiate with the Taliban to try to um, resolve things and withdraw our troops from Afghanistan. So I, I suspect that maybe the Taliban was the one that offered that information about Russia's um, intentions. So maybe that was the reason to not reveal it. I, I have no idea. It'll be interesting to see how things unfold. Interesting. Yeah, just, just a thought. Um, are economic sanctions a viable strategy to counteract Russia, being that current sanctions are proven to not work? Would a more diplomatic approach lead to a lessening of Russian aggression and a drop in popularity for Putin, who is able to exploit the current circumstances for his own advantage? Well, I'm going um, to address the premise of the question, which based, the question is based on the assumption that economic sanctions don't work. And I'm not necessarily sure I'd agree with that. Economic sanctions might not be a definitive solution, but they can cause real discomfort and real unpleasantness and real pain for the target of those sanctions. Um, that's not to say that they shouldn't be coupled with diplomatic and if necessary military action, but I wouldn't be so quick to dismiss the impact of economic sanctions, particularly on a country like Russia, 
which is struggling so much with its own finances at this point, even before the pandemic, this was an economy, a national economy that was in free fall. And over the last few months, those challenges have only accelerated. So I don't, I don't know enough, even though I felt comfortable asking all of you guys the question, whether the U.S. should engage militarily or not, in militarily or not, in response to such provocation. But I do believe that economic sanctions are an important and can be a very forceful part of a broader uh, of a broader answer. So um, while I wouldn't rely on them unilaterally. And while that might not have as absolute an impact as the questioners understanding we're looking for, I think it can be part of a solution, even if not the entire answer. Thank you. Uh, this questioner says, I'm a Russian American who is very familiar with the situation in Afghanistan. What does not make sense to me in the Russian bounty to Taliban is why now in 2020, Americans, Russians, and the Taliban are all in Afghanistan for 30 plus years. So why now? Well. I think why now would imply that there are times when Russians and Americans and other global interests have not had an interest in Afghanistan. And at least in modern history, I'm not aware of any time when that's been the case. So this has been an ongoing situation for decades. The previous caller at, you know, referred back to the late, 19, uh, late 1970s and early 1980s. I don't know that there's anything particularly unique about this time period. Um, from the Russian point of view, uh, with two exceptions. One, as I mentioned earlier, Putin for decades, throughout his entire time in office, has demonstrated that when he feels like he is in trouble in terms of his base of support with the Russian people, his go-to move is a very nationalistic and very aggressive approach to rally his people around, around, around their leadership. And because he's in a particularly precarious time now, could see the added incentive on that front. But then second, Jessica, as you noted a, a couple of minutes ago, um, throughout all this, not only was President Trump looking for ways to work more closely with the Russian government and its leaders, but was also looking to finalize a peace agreement with the Taliban. And so it's entirely possible that Russian interests may have decided that this type of effort, this type of directly financed effort, uh, could have been an effective tool of undermining the prospects for that agreement. And in retrospect, it looks like they might have been right. Thank you. Um, pivoting a little bit back to the election, is it acceptable to go vote in November when we haven't seen any debates and very little about the policies of either candidate? And well, first of all, whether it's acceptable, acceptable or not to have an election in November, it's constitutionally required. And although the election can be delayed under certain very, very dire circumstances, what cannot be delayed is a peaceful transfer of power um, on January 20th of next year uh, from uh, the current president to the next one. And we can talk in more detail about how that would happen if there were not an election. But in any case, Borrowing, borrowing an absolutely even more catastrophic uh, outbreak of the COVID virus of the type that made voting absolutely impossible, or some either uh, some other equally apocalyptic situation, there will be an election in November, and the 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 question of course suggests that we have not yet been provided by the candidates or the campaigns with sufficient information on which to make our vote. Well, there will be debates this fall barring something very unexpected. The U.S. Commission on Presidential Debates has already scheduled three debates, presidential debates and one vice presidential debate for the fall. And between now and then and after the debates until the election day, both candidates will be talking quite a bit in public about their plans for the future. So voters might not find anything they like or anything that excites them from either of the two candidates, but there's no shortage of information available to us uh, about them. And so, um, although there are those types of extraordinary circumstances that would keep an election from happening, I don't think a lack of information should do that, especially because so much information is and will continue to be available. Thank you. Um, do you think Fox will ever abandon Trump? And I have a, a little comment on this. I know Tucker Carlson was trending on Twitter a couple of nights ago, and he's the highest rated 
network news cable host in history. So my guess is they probably won't. Well, when when Fox News you know, was founded yeah, a few decades ago, uh, Roger Ailes and Rupert Murdoch, it's been reported, decided to start that cable channel, not necessarily out of deep-seated conservative ideological conviction, but rather just uh, a very, um, uh, well, out of, out of, out of a, a business-based decision. They saw a gap in the marketplace. And what they had identified through market research was a large cohort of the American people that didn't feel like the mainstream media in that era, the three broadcast networks and CNN and the major newspapers were serving their needs. I suspect that if Ailes and Murdoch had found that mainstream news media was satisfactorily serving the needs of conservative Americans, they might have thought to start a more left-leaning cable network. But they saw a large number of voters who didn't feel like major mainstream news media was speaking to them, and they took advantage of that opportunity in the marketplace. Now, Ailes, of course, has passed on. Uh, Murdoch has handed over control for the most part of the network to his sons. And so in the future, if this was a, uh, a network that was born out of market opportunity, not intense ideological commitment, I suspect if at some point in the future, either that cohort of uh, rightward leaning Americans felt that they could get that news, the news they needed from somewhere else, whether from CNN or from one, one American network or, or anywhere else, then Fox News might rethink its basic grounding. But I think it is important to remember, both in looking at their history and looking at their future, that their positioning is based on marketplace analytics. And as long as they believe that there is an underserved audience that is supportive and admiring of, uh, of Donald Trump, they'll continue to serve that audience. When that changes, I would not be surprised to see, see if, they were to, if they were to change also. Thank you. Several days ago, new news outlets were reporting the possibility of Trump dropping out of the race if his poll numbers continue to drop, so he won't have to face a defeat. Do you think this is possible? And if so, what would it mean for the election? Well, I think now's a good time to hold up the mug that Jessica and her colleagues got me. Um, and so for those of you who can see it, you know, it says no to predictions, yes to coffee. As you probably gathered, I am a little bit caffeinated today. There's a lot going on in the world. Um, but that doesn't make me any more likely to make predictions. Um, and predicting Donald Trump is even a more hazardous exercise than making any other kind of political prognostication. Um, I would say this, is that the political news, both polling and on other fronts, has been unrelentingly difficult for Trump for the last few weeks. And not only through body language, but through, through some of his public statements, it's made it clear that he's aware that he's struggling and is somewhat resentful that he's not getting the credit he believes he's due. Would he actually step down from the ticket? I think not, if only because he, Trump, knows that one-term presidents, well, let's say that he knows, Donald Trump believes that one-term presidents are viewed by history as losers. And he points to Jimmy Carter, he points to Gerald Ford, he points to George H.W. Bush, and feels that they are judged harshly because they were not able to win re-election. Um, so I believe that Trump feels that re-election will validate him and allow him to push back uh, more convincingly against the criticisms he's faced over the last several years. Backing away from that challenge, I think, would only happen if we were facing, as a country, an untold set of, uh, of circumstances that, um, that made it untenable for him to continue. But I think he is generally isn't the type who backs down from a fight. And so while I won't make a prediction, I think what is more likely is that if he is not reelected, and of course that's still an if, it's more likely that he would lose and try to discredit that loss on mail voting or on some other outside uh, phenomena or some type of outside influence simply than, uh, rather than simply withdrawing. He would be better off I think, given his his worldview, at retreating post-election, 
in rallying his troops for some further fight in the future, as opposed to simply withdrawing, because then I think it would be much more difficult for him to go back to his most loyal supporters to try to convince them to follow him on some type of endeavor down the line. So you never say never, um, but it seems pretty unlikely. Thank you. Um, recently, when pressed by a reporter, Biden commented that he has been tested for his cognitive decline. Given the mounting concerns raised about Biden's mental state, especially among those coveted younger voters, do you believe the Biden campaign should and or will publicly release his medical records? And can you speak on the poll from earlier this week where a significant number of voters on both sides thought that Biden was experiencing uh, early onset dementia? I have to admit, I did, I did not see the poll that the questioner is referring to. I have seen quite a bit of polling that shows that voters believe that Donald Trump has much more energy with which to do the job of president than Joe Biden does. Um, and that is a challenge for Biden going forward to some degree, because they, if voters are going to be motivated by a candidate, they want to know that the candidate has just the motivation and the energy to accomplish his or her goals. So that, that energy gap is something I have seen in the polls. I've not seen the, the numbers that the, the questioner is referring to. Um, what I have seen is when Biden said uh, some days ago that he had been tested, I had the same reaction the questioner did. What kind of tests is Joe Biden being given to make sure that he has uh, yeah, all the tools he needs to progress? His campaign issued a statement, an explanation saying, that what Biden was talking about is that he felt he was tested in that regard every day on the campaign trail when he talked to voters, when he talked to reporters, that type of thing. Um, I, you know, Biden refers to himself as a human gaffe machine, so he may or may not have intended that when he said it, but it's clearly a line of criticism and a line of attack that the president and his advisors are going to continue to level against Biden, that he doesn't have. Uh, the grasp on on issues and doesn't retain enough of his faculties to continue. Um, the best way for Biden to disprove those is to continue to appear more on the campaign trail. He's benefited greatly from keeping a very low profile over the last few months, and he's risen in the polls while Trump's more public engagements have really harmed the president. Um, but I think that lower key strategy is something that Biden is going to have to build on and move away from in the months ahead um, as voters pay closer attention to the campaign and as these attacks get more uh, intense to, to disprove them by demonstrating that he's, he's still capable. Both of these men are in their 70s. Um, many people of that age experience some cognitive decline. Um, I've never seen a campaign in which these kind of accusations are made as publicly and as visibly and as harshly, uh, but it seems to me that the best way uh, is that, I, I, I don't know if they are true or not, but if I assume that the accusations against Biden are not true, but if they're not, it's on the former vice president to demonstrate that by a more visible and more engaged campaign effort going forward. Yeah, didn't, didn't they push McCain to do that as well in 2008, that they were questioning a lot of his health? Um, it was in actually in the 2000 campaign, and it's a, uh, in fact, uh, during the primary of that year, this, uh, I, I was in, involved in that campaign. Um, there were allegations that he had was that that he was struggling mentally and psychologically, not because of age, but because of something that may have happened during during his captivity during the Vietnam War. And so, what we decided to do on the campaign was to assemble and release a full set of the senator's medical records, both physical and psychological, and give reporters both access to those records and to his doctors in order to demonstrate to them that the accusations were, uh, were false. Thank you. Um, as I try to follow the coronavirus, I usually use the Johns Hopkins Worldometer or Worldometer. What source do you recommend? Well, whether it's the pandemic or the campaign, or any other matter of public import, I'm always hesitant to rely on one single source. The question, the version of this question that I hear more often 
is, Dan, where should I go for real news, for truth news, for real news, for reliable news? And the answer I always give is I ask the question, or I say, Jessica, who's your magic friend? And the person asks me, what do you mean magic friend? Yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot. And the, 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 the person always says, what do you mean magic friend? And I said, who's the person who you go to for advice on everything? On restaurants, on clothes, on movies, on new cars, on vacations, on schools for your kids, on everything. And when that person tells you something, you do what they say no matter what. And of course, none of us has that magic friend. When we make those decisions, whether they're on seminal decisions like buying a house or a school for our children, or whether they're day-to-day -day decisions like where to go for dinner or which movie to see, um, we rely on a range of sources. And to me, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's the campaign or any other current events issue, the single most important thing to do is draw news and information and analysis from a wide range of opinions, uh, from a wide range of sources across the ideological spectrum. And that kind of information gathering, I think gets you to a better conclusion the same way as doing the same kind of crowdsourcing when you're making the other kind of decisions in life that, that I was talking about. But thank you for the compliment, I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> I need to advise you on restaurants and movies after we finish this, uh, the webinar today. We'll definitely have to compare hair tips too. <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to take any advice from me on that. Um, okay. With the amount of coronavirus cases increasing daily, what do you think is causing the decrease in mortality? Well, the decrease in mortality, the, 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 the decrease in mortality, I think is more than anything, is simply a lagging indicator of the spread of the disease in hospitalizations. What we know is that while a large number of people who contract the coronavirus uh, contract, contract it asymptomatically without symptoms that are visible. So it's often some time before someone who contracted the virus needs to, be hop needs to go to a hospital or an ICU. It takes even more time before those people suffering from those cases worst actually suffer death. So the fact that we're seeing such a pronounced outbreak over these last couple of weeks doesn't mean that there won't be a higher mortality rate, just that it hasn't hit yet. The one other contributing factor, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this webinar, is it's clear over the last few weeks that in addition of the shift of the virus's primary impact from blue states to red states, from urban areas to small towns and rural areas, we're also seeing a, a very pronounced shift from older to younger people. And a younger person who gets the virus for any number of reasons, uh, they may fall ill, but that's less likely to be fatal for them. So while the number of cases and even the number of hospitalizations will grow as young people fall ill, at least right now, based on what the science understands, um, a young person is statistically less likely to be, to be affected in such a horrific way that, they, that it ultimately proves fatal. So one, it's a delay mechanism. Second, young people are just as likely to get sick, but not as likely to, to perish as a result of the disease. Thank you so much. Um, and this will probably be our final question because I know we're almost out of time. Wouldn't the new employment numbers reflect a good number of people going back to the same jobs they were furloughed or let go from? It's a great question. Um, most of today's employment numbers reflect people who are going back to their prior jobs. Even while the unemployment rate is going down, we are seeing increasing numbers even last month of so-called permanent job loss. So it's a relatively small number of people who are finding new jobs. Most of them are being called job back to jobs from which they were either furloughed or laid off from previously. And one of the real dangers of the impacts of the last couple of weeks is a large portion of those rehires were in the retail and hospitality industries. And of course, those are the ones that are going to suffer most disproportionately from uh, a new round of, of business shutdowns. So I actually answered a question briefly for a change, Jessica. Maybe we can do one more and then and then wrap up. Uh-oh, um, I'm not able to hear you, Apologies. Jessica. I, I I'm sorry, you I closed my window. Me, you were asking me to give hair tips, which I thought was very thoughtful. Um, no, no problem. <laughs> you have great up. hair. I just have, I just have different hair. Um, I have heard reports that there is a possibility that Clarence Thomas might resign sorry, Clarence Thomas, might resign from the Supreme Court this year. Is that a possibility? It's, it's unlikely. Uh, 
most of the speculation about retirements from the court have centered on Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, because she has faced a, you know, she's, she has faced a series of health difficulties. And it becomes it's pretty clear that unless something absolutely horrible were to happen to her, that Justice Ginsburg seems pretty determined to stay on at least until November or January in hopes that a President Biden would be more likely to appoint a successor that she'd find like-minded than President Trump would. Uh, but recently it's been pointed out that uh, the Justice Thomas, you know, who's a, you know, you know, who's been on the bench for you know a quarter of a century or so, um, uh, is also thinking about stepping down. I think it's less likely that he would do that between now and November, Jessica, if only because his resignation now um, would make it very unlikely that his replacement could be confirmed before November. While Republicans uh, uh, maintain a majority in the Senate, it's a relatively narrow one. And the likelihood of a justice, at least the type of justice President Trump has acknowledged he would like to appoint, the likelihood of a Thomas Gorsuch Kavanaugh-ish justice getting confirmed between now and election day would require a much, much faster set of actions than the Senate can normally pull off. Mitch McConnell loves to appoint, confirm judges, but this one might be a bridge too far. So while it's not impossible, and we've seen in the past the lengths that uh, Senator McConnell is willing to go through in order to uh, confirm judges, it's, uh, I think what's more likely is that Thomas would hold on until Trump were reelected and then retire early next year. Or if Biden were elected president, he might just hunker down and stay on hoping he can uh, hold that seat until another Republican is elected president in 2024 or at a future date. Yeah, so it sounds, seems like we still have a really bumpy road ahead of us no matter what. So. Um, thank you for giving us that little bit of Thursday calm with uh, these great discussions. And Kim, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Jessica. Dan, thank you so much for your expert insights and analysis. We look forward to it every Thursday at 11 o'clock. So we hope to see all of your fans next, next week. We have a terrific lineup coming up for all of you in the next few months, but I'll highlight a couple of them. July 7th, we have opportunities for foreign policy in Assad's new Syria. July 14th, it's a Bastille Day discussion with uh, talking about uh, President Macron and France and um, Europe's place in the world. And July 20th, uh, we'll be discussing whether climate change is the biggest environmental concern. So please check out all of our upcoming programs on our website at lawac.org. Please stay safe, stay informed, and we'll see you all next week. Dan, thanks so much.